Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm your host, Henry Arslanian, and welcome to this episode of the Future of Money podcast. Before we start, I want to say a big thank you to the half a million of you who follow my content each week. This podcast, The Future of Money, is now ranked in the top 5% of all podcasts globally on Spotify. There are thousands of you from over 160 countries globally that are tuning in each week. So a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your support. As all of you loyal listeners know, my goal with this podcast is very simple. It's to go deep in some of the biggest ideas, trends, and developments we are seeing in the field of crypto, and hopefully empower you with this information, and then let you make your own decision on what their impact can be on the future of money and future of finance. To do this, I invite each week one of the leading figures of the global crypto community to have this one-on-one conversation amongst crypto aficionados and discuss some of these topics. Today, as we're recording this episode, it's been another tumultuous time in the history of crypto. Silicon Valley Bank, Silvergate Bank, and Signature Bank all basically disappeared. Many said in the crypto ecosystem have been quite skeptical and believe that some of these banks, in particular Signature Bank, was actually shut down due to its crypto business. There's been numerous rumors that when the FDIC was selling the bank, uh, it was actually trying to exclude the crypto business, something that the FDIC denied. However, however, subsequently on March 28, it was reported in the media that Signature gave its clients one week to actually move the money out. And of course, this happens in the broader anti-crypto of regulation by enforcement mindset that we are seeing right now uh, across the various regulators in the U.S. So today, actually, we want to discuss what is kind of the, is this even allowed? Isn't this in many cases a, a, a problem when it comes to due process? And today we're going to discuss it with David Thompson, a managing partner at Cooper & Kirk. We actually, the, the firm published recently a white paper called Oper- Operation Choke Point 2.0, The Federal Bank Regulators Come for Crypto, where they analyze some of the legal implications and actually the constitutional um, impact, the constitutional law potential protections that are in place, and whether some of these actions that were taken by the regulators are a breach of due process and other statutory uh, requirements. Before we start, before I go forward, I want to make my regular disclosures. Today, we're going to talk about the three major banks that we had in the crypto ecosystem, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature, and Silvergate. Due to the fact that over 90% probably of the crypto companies were banking with these banks, uh, it's very likely that some of my current or past sponsors of the show, including businesses that I'm involved in as an investor or other ways, are clients of these banks. Now that we have the disclosures behind us, David, David Thompson, Managing Partner at Cooper & Kirk, welcome to the future of money. Henry, it's great to be with you. Thank you for having me today. One thing, by the way, many people may not know about you, David, is that you hired Ted Cruz and Tom Cotton as young lawyers back in the day before they went on to having their careers as senators. Very interesting track record on that perspective of having hired uh, two senators to join you in the early days. That's right. Absolutely. So, David, before we move on and talk about some of these very interesting topics, can you give to the audience a bit of a summary about your background and what type of work in this area does your, that your firm does? Sure. We're a litigation boutique, and we've been in business for 27 years, and we have cases all over the country. I'm doing cases in about 22 states right now. We do First Amendment, Second Amendment, property rights, separation of powers, but really the sweet spot of what we do is fighting regulatory excess. And that's what we had in Operation Choke Point 1.0, and that's what we have today with this illegal action focused on the crypto industry. I love the term regulatory excess, and we're going to really zoom in on that. But before that, I think for the benefit of our audience, in the crypto community right now, we talk about this operation choke point and everything that's taking place against the crypto community. What was interesting in your white paper is that this is not the first time that it's happening. When maybe this is operation choke point 2.0, but we had operation choke point 1.0. Can you share with our audience what was that about? What industries were targeted and what was the outcome of that? Yes, it was about a decade ago. Back in 2012, the Obama administration, some of its top banking officials decided, look, there were some industries they didn't like. And some of them were illegal, like Ponzi schemes, but others of them were just politically disfavored, payday lenders gun stores, uh, tobacco uh, industry. And they decided, look, you know, one way we can really hurt those industries 
is by cutting them off from the modern financial system. And so there was a systematic effort to target those industries. You know, they came after the gunsters at first. And uh, just to give one example, in Wisconsin, they uh, told a, a bank, you need to sever relationships with this gun store. The gun store then went to Facebook and told everyone in town, hey, this bank doesn't like guns uh, in the gun industry. You should pull your deposits. And there was a bank run uh, the next day. And the regulators backed off the gun industry because they had allies, they had real people on the ground who were passionate about the Second Amendment and uh, were willing to fight back. So then they turned their attention to the payday lenders and the payday lenders didn't have that sort of popular support where they could cause a bank run. And slowly but surely, you know, the top brass at the FDIC put out the word, we do not want banks doing business uh, with payday lenders. And they systematically choked them off uh, from the banking industry. And as you can imagine, if you're a lender cut off from the financial industry, it's devastating. And it was absolutely terrible. And one of the things, Henry, that was striking about it was not only was it illegal, but it was done in secret. The regulators denied the existence of this program. We filed litigation. We got their internal emails. We put the malefactors under oath and deposition. And we were able to prove that, in fact, it was happening just as we suspected. And I want to share one little vignette that's not in the white paper, I don't believe, but it relates to there was one bank uh, that wasn't backing down from the pressure. And uh, so the FDIC went, met with that bank and said, we could criminally refer you. In other words, we could have you prosecuted if you don't stop, uh, you know, this conduct. And that was total BS. There was no criminal violation whatsoever. But obviously, a bank CEO does not want to have that threat hang over his head. So the bank CEO the next day says, OK, we get the joke. We'll, we'll stop uh, banking these payday lenders. The day after that, the bank regulators emailed saying it would be really nice if you would portray this as a voluntary decision. So the whitewash and the cover up was absolutely immediate. Not only were they sneaking around and doing this illegal conduct, they were trying to cover their tracks in real time. And one of the other aspects of this that everyone needs to understand is something called the bank examination privilege. Um, this is basically a, a, an idea, a concept uh, that the regulators, what the regulators say to the banks is privileged. And it's a privilege that belongs to the regulators. So when the regulators issue these threats, and then we try to get access to those emails uh, or those communications. The regulators are going to say, oh, we can't share that with you. You know, that would implicate safety and soundness. So that's, you know, that was one of the challenges we had in Choke Point. Fortunately, we had 1.0. We had some banks who were willing to come forward and tell us the truth. And we're having that now in 2.0. Just yesterday, uh, I had detailed communications with the bank CEO who was uh, telling me about the regulatory harassment uh, to which his institution's being subjected by the regulators. This is very interesting, David. There's so many things you mentioned I want to deep dive into. And maybe just before that, right? So let's say I want to talk about, obviously, the discovery element you mentioned, some of the threats. But before that, um, you know, if we talk to the common person on the street, they'll say, well, a bank as a private company as a bank, I had the discretion to choose who I want as my clients. So even do even constitutional protections or do even regulatory protections even apply, or it's a purely commercial matter between two private companies, in this case, let's say a crypto company and a bank who can decide who could be their clients. Right. In uh, constitutional litigation, what we look for is state action. So if it's just two private parties who are making decisions about, you know, the way in which they want to interact with each other, that typically doesn't implicate the United States Constitution. But when you have the federal government or state government, you know, coming in and putting its thumb uh, on the scale and forcing someone to engage in a particular type of action, either through a law or through a backroom pressure campaign, either way, now you've got state action. Now the protections of the United States Constitution come in. And that's what we have here. So I think, that, yeah, so the important point is actually here is the actions of the excess, regulatory excess you mentioned of the regulator and the government. It's actually not the actions that people can take or not against the bank. It's actually against the actions the regulator has taken in that case. 
That's right. If, if there was some bank out there who just said, look, you know, I don't like crypto. I don't want to do business with them. Then that would be their, their right. They would be, uh, you know, or at least it wouldn't violate the Constitution. There might be some other problems, but it wouldn't violate the United States Constitution. Unfortunately, that's not what we seem to be having here. We seem to have a coordinated governmental program to pressure these financial institutions to cut off the crypto industry. And I want to I want to come back to these points of the threats and uh, stuff. But before I move to that, right? I, can you share with our audience in your white paper? Obviously, you talk about the uh, the constitutional protections that are in place, especially when it comes to due process and the constitutional protection. Do you mind sharing with our audience what is that constitutional protection that is in place, especially as it relates to due process, and how does it apply in this particular instance? Yeah, the basic concept of due process under the United States Constitution is that the government, and whether it's the federal government or the, the state governments, cannot take your property away without notice and an opportunity to be heard. And here, and the courts have been very clear on this, having a bank account is a right. It is a property right. Uh, and it's also a property right to be able to engage in your preferred line of business, provided it's not illegal. Um, and, and both of those rights have been implicated in choke point 1.0. And again, here in choke point 2.0, because number one, they're having people debanked these pressure campaigns. We're seeing it. We lay it out in our white paper. There are, uh, uh, crypto companies that are being debanked. There are crypto officials who are being debanked. Uh, and it seems quite clear uh, that it's a result of regulatory pressure. And there's no notice. There's no opportunity to be heard, uh, you know, and number one. And then they're also really now jeopardizing some companies' abilities to even exist. And obviously, that's a property right, too. So for both of those reasons, there's a property rights are uh, implicated here. And the government isn't giving notice and an opportunity to be heard. I think you raise a good point. I mean, if uh, according to media reports this week, a signature gave his clients literally one week uh, to move its funds out, which is, uh, I mean, you and I as an individual, it's difficult to open an account in a week, let alone for a company, let alone a crypto company in this. Uh, in this so you're actually right from a proper law perspective. I can see how there's a potential case there. And let me say, Henry, you know, it's it's no answer for the government to say, well, you were able to get another account, okay? Uh, because uh, the key case is called Wisconsin versus Constantino. And that was an instance in which a woman, uh, you know, they posted a sign, her town did, uh, saying she's got a drinking problem, don't sell her alcohol. All she had to do was drive to the town next door, which she did, and buy liquor there. And that was still deemed to be a violation of due process by the United States Supreme Court. So the fact that at least for the time being, there are still some banks who are willing to participate and bank with the industry, that's not an answer uh, to for or a defense for, for the government. And we saw in choke point 1.0, by the way, that as fewer and fewer banks were willing to bank the payday lending industry, the ones who remained jacked up their fees and started charging more because, you know, they uh, there was just fewer, less competition. Interesting. So the first argument you mentioned in your white paper you just mentioned is this kind of this constitutional protection of you know, property, basically, where there's obviously the guarantees of due process. You mentioned a second argument, which is the statutory duty, where basically the bank regulators exceeded their statutory authority and or they were not performing their statutory duties. Can you share about, or with our audience what that second argument that you guys put forward uh, is about? Sure. Yes. Yeah. So there's uh, something called the Administrative Procedures Act. And basically, whenever a federal governmental entity violates in excess of its statutory authorities, then it violates the Administrative Procedures Act. And here we have substantive violations and we have procedural violations. The substantive violation is that the bank regulators do not have the authority to declare an industry illegal or to be unbanked because they don't like it. Um, they can't do that to payday lenders. They can't do that to the firearms industry. And they can't do that to the crypto industry. There is nowhere you can search the statutes. They don't have that authority. That's what they appear to be doing. And that is a violation uh, of their statutory uh, obligations and responsibilities. That's the substantive problem. 
But there's also a procedural problem because in the United States, we have what's called notice and comment requirements. Whenever the regulators are going to take a final agency action, an action that will have the force of law, they have to, because they are unelected bureaucrats, one of the checks on that, since we're supposed to live in a democracy, is that they have to publish and say, this is what we're planning to do, give the public an opportunity to tell them why what they're planning to do is illegal or stupid or ill-advised, whatever. And then they have to consider those comments. And only then can they move forward with the final regulation and the final rule. And they haven't done that here. They haven't uh, abided by notice and comment. They're you know, sneaking around uh, with, in, quote, informal guidance, always accompanied with the Orwellian disclaimer, which we saw in Choke Point 1.0, that you know, nothing that we say precludes you from doing uh, business with the crypto industry, wink, nod. But everybody gets the joke. Everybody understands what's going on, and that's not going to save them from uh, failing to abide by notice and comment. So they have procedural problems and substantive problems. It's very interesting from that perspective. So actually, can we talk about more, like there's a procedure element in the substance, right? But from what you're, what you're mentioning, there were some threats on behalf of regulators against uh, banking officials. I remember now it's coming back. Actually, when you're talking, I'm remembering my constitutional law classes back in law school. But I know, for example, in criminal law matters, right? If I'm being interrogated uh, in a cell after I've been arrested, there are certain things that the cops are not allowed to tell me. They cannot make me false lies or they cannot insinuate certain things. When it comes to let's say, uh, procedural matters, let's say when it comes to the, these threats that you're saying regulators have made to the bank executives, the bank CEOs, aren't there uh, prohibitions against what regulators can say to these executives, especially when it's threats and, and things around those lines? A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, this goes back to, so in choke point 1.0, they were saying, we think it's a problem, you know, if you're banking the payday lending industry. And so sometimes it was subtle. Sometimes it was not so subtle. But, you know, they made clear we don't want you banking this industry. And whether it's subtle or explicit, that's an authority they don't have. They can't pick an industry they don't like and then try to cut them off from the financial services uh, structure of the United States. That's not a power that Congress has conferred on these regulators. And thank God for that. You know, we don't want a bunch of uh, unelected bureaucrats deciding which new industry or which old industry is going to be legal or not. That's something for Congress to decide, not bank regulators. So actually, would, which brings back to my other question that I had for you, David, is so in your white paper, you mentioned these two uh, arguments, and then you say, what can Congress do? So yeah. obviously, if this is something that Congress has not provided to these uh, regulators who are a creation, a creature of law or, or creature of regulation, what can actually Congress do? What is the, uh, there's obviously, I'm sure there's a lot of judiciary uh, remedies that can take place now, but from a Congress perspective, legislative perspective, what can actually Congress do? Well, I think there are two basic things, Henry, that Congress can do. The first and most important is fact finding. Um, as I said, because of these bank examination privileges, the regulators are going to try to obfuscate. They're not going to come forward. Uh, if we engage in litigation, uh, I, I believe we would ultimately get, uh, you know, the emails and, and put people under oath, but that could take a year or two. Whereas if Congress, you know, issues a subpoena and, uh, says, Hey, we want these documents and we want them now, that really forces the issue. And Congress does not uh, abide by or recognize any of these privileges either. So Congress can obtain the material, Congress can make it uh, public. And in choke point 1.0, that was a critical part of this. Uh, and we're already seeing that dynamic playing out in choke point 2.0, because as you may recall, and we put in the white paper, Senator Toomey was approached by whistleblowers and has publicly uh, put that out. And so that's very helpful that we're saying, yes, in fact, we have current FDIC employees who are going to uh, sympathetic allies in Congress and telling them what's really happening. And then, of course, we see that playing out in the real world where there are all these unexplained uh, bank cancellations and whatnot. And by the way, you know, pretty much every bank cancellation is suspicious when there isn't a credit risk or an interest rate risk or a liquidity risk associated with it because banks are in the business of making money and they like having customers. Um, and so the first First aspect of this is the fact finding uh, that Congress needs to do, but the second of it is is substantive. Um, you know, they can uh, have oversight hearings uh, and they can just lay down the law. I mean, really, they shouldn't have to do anything in terms of substantive law because already it's illegal. But of course, they could clarify that if they wanted to. 
So it's interesting. I mean, the big question here, you know, when I give a lot of my keynotes at, at crypto events and other events, uh, you know, I say in 2023, the crypto industry is like the wounded gazelle in the middle of the Serengeti, right? It's a very easy target, especially following FTX and the whole debacle that ensued. In order to be able to get that Congress support and to have hearings on this topic, you obviously need political support. Do you believe, I mean, from a practical perspective, it's not a real legal question, but the crypto community can gather, I mean, you mentioned obviously one example, but the crypto community can get, gather enough um, support from elected officials to make that case. Because I would argue if I'm an elected official right now, uh, you know, if we ask the average Joe in the street, especially as we're going to elections in the US in the next two years, they probably don't have a very positive view of the crypto industry. I would argue many in many cases the, the same way that if the average person on the street may not have a positive view of some of the industries that were in choke point 1.0. So what what would you be your advice to the crypto community? Is there is it more lobbying involved? Is it better uh, or there's enough senators that would take this case because they believe it's a violation of the constitution? Well, here's the good news, which is payday lenders uh, a decade ago were not a sympathetic group. I think they get a bad rap, but in any event, the reality was uh, unfairly or not, uh, it was not a group that had a groundswell of popular support. And so the allies that we looked for then and that we would need to look for today are those who believe in the rule of law. And at least back a decade ago, there were some conservative Republicans who they didn't, you know, they weren't necessarily sympathetic to the payday lending industry, but they thought, hey, we have laws in this country and, and, and it's important that they be respected. And so that's why we had uh, the House Republicans and Chairman Issa, you know, was very involved and very aggressive on this because he realized, fine, today it might be an industry that's unpopular and that nobody likes, but tomorrow is it going to be, you know, uh, this industry or that industry that, you know, people really do are passionate about. And so someone who's really committed to the the rule of law understands this is very pernicious. There's a scene at the end of uh, a, a Man for All Seasons uh, where they talk about chopping down the trees to uh, get at the devil. And, and the, the concern that Sir Thomas More has is when you've chopped down all the trees in the forest to get at the devil and he turns on you, what's going to protect you then? And those trees are the law. And, and so those are the allies we need to find in Congress. And they exist today, uh, number one. And then number two, the courts. You know, judges take an oath to follow the law, not just for the popular industries, not just based on polling data, but based on what the statutes and the Constitution of the United States said. And we were very fortunate. Uh, we had a judge uh, last time who, uh, you know, followed the law and said that uh, we had stated a claim for due process and allowed us to take that discovery and uncover the whole tissue of uh, lies that had been told. It's very interesting. Actually, if you think about the lobbying of the crypto industry, it should not be to, to find favorable senators or Congress, uh, a matter of women who are like, like the crypto industry, but actually people who believe in the Constitution and that the preservation of rights. And, and actually, I agree with you on the judiciary. Uh, you know, I think this is a topic that's been discussed more recently in the crypto community, that probably the one bastion that the crypto community is putting its hopes on is a judiciary where if you believe in the separation of powers, this actually, the, the judiciary will look at it from an objective perspective. I mean, the argument there, uh, David, is that by the time this goes to litigation, like, like by the time there is discovery, this goes litigation and obviously the process takes place, uh, it's going to take months, if not years. And by then, I mean, a, a lot of the crypto industry in the US could be dead because of the reasons if they don't have a bank account, they cannot operate. Is this something that you saw in Operation Choke Point 1.0? Or do you think this is um, a just a reality just to the nature of how the judiciary works? Well, look, it, it, it is a reality that litigation takes uh, takes a, a while. But here's the thing. This is a public policy fight. And Justice Brandeis said sunlight is the best disinfectant. And so we need to shine a spotlight on this bad behavior uh, because it will have a salutary influence. I believe it will slow if it is being exposed and eventually they, they will wither. And that's what happened under the bright glare of the facts, facts that were exposed by Congress, facts that were exposed by my firm after discovery, um, then, uh, you know, and, and a change in administration. Okay. And so that's part of this is to gather the facts 
so that if there is a new administration in two years, we can go and we can say, look at what's been happening. This is egregious. We're not just making this up. We're not paranoid. Uh, this has been totally illegal. And perhaps we will have received judicial assistance before then. But if not, then we're in a position, a maximally strong position to say, tell the regulators to knock it off, to stop. And that's what did happen in, in choke point 1.0. It did take several years. Some of the industry uh, was just crippled, but most of it, uh, the payday lenders survived. Uh, and then we were able to go to the Trump administration and settle the case. And one of the reasons we were able to is, you know, the Wall Street Journal was doing lead editorials about this saying, look, this is illegal. This needs to stop. This is very pernicious. And I think the same thing, uh, that same type of dynamic could play out here. So it's a very, very interesting. So from a, you mentioned, obviously, there was regulatory excess. I mean, to clarify, what are the regulators are we talking here? Is it the FDIC? There's obviously, when you look at the crypto ecosystem today, uh, to say there's a lack of cohesion is an understatement. I mean, we had just last week, uh, the SEC, as a, a chairman, Gary Gensler, say that Ethereum is a security and we had on Monday, as we're recording this, uh, the CFTC in a, in a, in a legal complaint, uh, say that Ethereum and Bitcoin and Litecoin are commodities. So even between the CFTC and the SEC, there's a bit of confusion. Um, who, when you're saying this regulatory excess, is it against the FTIC? Is it other banking regulators? Can you maybe clarify for our audience, who are we talking about when it comes to regulators, when we talk about regulatory excess? Yes, that's a great question, Henry. And, and the short answer is, you know, I'm not, I haven't been able to take the discovery. I haven't been able to read all the internal emails, so I can't point fingers at specific individuals. But, you know, it was very telling on January 3 of this year that the Federal Reserve, the OCC, and the FDIC had a joint statement that was basically very anti-crypto, uh, warding uh, banks off. And we that's when we started to see a real pickup in this debanking uh, move. It was after that joint statement. Uh, and so I, I think all three of them, I suspect, I don't know, at the end of the day, we'll see that they all in their different ways are putting pressure. One of the things that's different about this uh, episode is the involvement of the states. In choke point 1.0, we didn't really have the states involved. Here we've got the state of New York coming in, seizing a bank that seems to be perfectly healthy, you know, uh, after everyone had been told you're going to be able to get your deposits. So you've got a bank that is not insolvent and they seize it. Why? They claim because we weren't getting enough information from them. That is nonsense. I think you can look at the history of the United States and there's never been a single bank that was seized because the regulators wanted to get some more information from them. Typically, there'd be a cease and desist letter or prompt corrective action or some sort of slap on the wrist, come on, get your act together. Uh, but it, but you won't seize the bank. And we, you know, we see that uh, they're taking the exchange, the ledgering uh, system of signature, and they're not selling it. And that is a separate legal problem. That is a taking of property. Because when uh, the United States government, the FDIC takes over uh, a bank, it has a fiduciary responsibility. It has a statutory responsibility responsibility and a constitutional responsibility to maximize the value of the assets for everybody in that waterfall, basically the shareholders and the subordinated debt holders. And here, at least thus far, it's been egregious. We heard the whistleblowers come forward and say they're not marketing, they're not letting people bid on this ledgering system, and they deny it publicly, again, just like they did in choke point 1.0. And then we see the proof. They sell it without the ledgering system. And that's egregious because presumably that would be a very valuable asset that should have been uh, sold. And that would be another uh, potential legal action for taking a property. It's very, very interesting. Yeah, actually what you're saying when your job is to maximize assets, uh, the fact that you're not selling one part of a business is a violation uh, uh, on its own, which is very interesting. I haven't thought about that. I mean, you mentioned one thing, David, I want to touch upon you. I mean, and if I put my lawyer hat on a second and I have none of your experience when it comes to litigation or uh, backing matters, but when, and I agree with you, right? Normally when there's a lack of information, there's different steps you go before shutting down any organization. But if this happens, is there a way for a bank to get an injunction, for example, when the FDIC comes over? And again, I'm not an expert at all about FDIC matters, but are there protections in place for the, def not really the defendant, but let's say the bank, to get an injunction against such regulatory excess or regulatory action? Yes, there is. I mean, that is the remedy uh, that would be uh, appropriate, would be an injunction to tell the regulators, stop this. Stop putting pressure on the banks to cut off 
the crypto industry. That that would be what the injunction says. What makes it tricky here is that the regulators deny it, right? This was in, in choke point 1.0. They said, well, we're not doing it. So, you know, you get an injunction. They said, well, we're happy to abide by the injunction. We've never done it before. We're still not doing it. And, you know, eventually we were able to prove uh, that, in fact, they were doing it uh, and and uh, able to settle it. And, and they agreed to stop. Uh, you know, that, that campaign, but it, it, it does, you know, in most of my cases that I do, the action that you're trying to enjoin, at least everyone can agree that it's going on and then you can tell. But because this is done in the back room, because it's done under the secrecy uh, of the bank examination privilege, it becomes a little bit harder uh, to to have that uh, injunction to have the same robustness. You know, if you, you you take an issue like, you know, can you carry a gun? Well, if you get an injunction against a ban on carrying a gun, you can tell the next day, hey, is the injunction working or not? Here, it's more subtle because the regulators have a variety of ways to punish and send signals uh, to people uh, about what they want. I mean, I, I definitely agree with you when it comes to cases where you're trying to prove collusion or there was actually a, a coercive approach. But I'm thinking that if the FDIC comes and takes over a bank, I don't know if there's any kind of getting injunction relief on a certain action on the spot. I don't know if it's even possible, but, uh, but I don't even know if you know the answer. I think it would be very, I think it would very, be very tough to stop them from taking a bank. Um, now they might have to pay, you know, the signature shareholders for squandering a multi-billion dollar asset. Um, but I, I, I think it would be very difficult to stop them from taking a bank, but they could be stopped from their illegal backroom pressure campaign. Yeah. Very interesting. One other question for you, David, obviously you mentioned, you know, in any legal case that you're involved in, you need somebody who's you know, the, the plaintiff, you know, I mean, I would imagine today, like you mentioned, if you're a bank CEO uh, to take an action against the regulators, I mean, it's pretty much professional suicide, right? On that perspective. Is this something that comes up in that case that who you think could be some, who would take action in such cases? Well, in choke point 1.0, it was the payday lenders themselves, because you're right. The banks are terrified of the regulators. It's like dealing with the mafia, except worse, because they have unlimited resources. And, and you know, they've got all these protections about privileges and everything else. Uh, and they, they pr- pretend to put on a white hat. Uh, and, and so it's a very uh, difficult and, and relationship for the banks. So we don't expect banks to come forward and, and be uh, and to litigate. Uh, but uh, it is helpful when they come forward with information, as I indicated, you know, is already beginning to happen, uh, number one. And number two, the customers themselves have been injured. Go back to that due process claim we talked about. The customers have a constitutional right to participate in the banking industry. And so when that's uh, cut off from them, when they lose a bank account unfairly because of illegal backroom pressure, uh, then they would have what's called standing. They will have been injured by that fact, and then they can come forward and, and sue. And I mean, obviously, but I don't know if, if your law firm is doing something in particular on this, but how does this happen? Is it a collective lawsuit normally? How would this take shape? Well, a lot of times it'll be a trade association because they have members who have been impacted in different ways. Uh, but, but it can also be the individual participants. It really doesn't matter because, you know, in terms of number one, the mere pendency of a lawsuit would presumably have a salutary influence and that people are going to be a little more careful if they realize, oh gosh, you know, I may be deposed. My emails may be read. Number one. Number two, once we get in there and we expose it all, uh, that's helpful. And, and if it, it, it doesn't, you know, if, if we get in there and we can expose this was a plot at the highest levels of the government, you know, it doesn't matter whether you have one plaintiff or you have a hundred plaintiffs. So you really only need one or two plaintiffs to be, to make this effective. And I would suspect it would be either a trade association or, you know, someone who uh, whose rights had been violated. Yeah. You know, what's interesting, David, is if you look at it from a crypto perspective, uh, like I mentioned at the introduction, uh, you know, I would say a conservative number is 90 percent of the crypto industry, pretty much globally even, was banking with these three banks. And there's a very simple reason. Even a lot of cr- companies that have nothing to do with the U.S., they're completely in other jurisdictions. Um, it's very difficult for them to bank uh, if they're a crypto company. For one reason is a lot of international banks were worried about losing their correspondent banking relationships. So they have many companies from Asia, from Europe, from Africa, Latin America. They would use a Silvergate, a Signature, or even SVB for that particular reason. And so there's a, there was a concentration risk. Actually, in my last book, The Book of Crypto, I have a whole chapter where I talk about how these banks 
are kind of uh, systemically important that if anything happens to these banks, it may affect uh, the the industry. And it's ironic that what happened now uh, from, from from that perspective. I mean, David, so if you had a piece of advice today, right, in our a lot of my, a lot of my listeners, uh, they're crypto CEOs, uh, they're people in the industry. What will be your advice to the crypto community right now with everything that you've seen in the last couple of days and your experience in this kind of matters? I would say it is imperative to get the facts out. That involves activating allies in Capitol Hill on the Republican side in the House. Uh, that involves going to CEOs and others in banks who would be willing to tell, even if it's on background, uh, what, what's really happening. We have to get the truth out. If we can get the truth out, Number one, uh, you know, this is America. We still have the rule of law, and, and I believe ultimately it will be vindicated. And, and second of all, it will dramatically help the prospects of any litigation that may be forthcoming if we have the facts. So it's really important uh, for everyone to stand up and be willing to say, this is what's happened. I was told this by this bank official, you know, um, you know, that, that's how it has to happen because if everyone's afraid and, and just remains quiet, uh, then, you know, it's not going to work. Um, and, uh, you know, democracy dies in the dark. Uh, we need sunlight uh, on this problem. And, and that's, the, that's the key. I have to say that, uh, David, I was not aware about the privilege matter that uh, uh, the bank uh, secrecy, or whatever, I forgot, I forgot the name of the legislation. I didn't know that. The, when yeah, the bank through. examination privilege. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's outrageous. I, did, I was not aware of that. So actually, what information can you gather? So when the regulators uh, are questioning a bank CEO or they're discussing among themselves, there are certain pieces of information that are, are privileged, basically. So no, no, it can never be made public. Well, the good news is when they're talking amongst themselves, that's not privileged uh, because now they may claim it's a deliberative process privilege uh, where, you know, we were thinking about what action to take. And that's another fight we have to have uh, with them. But at least if they're talking about what they've done in the past, that is not privileged at all. OK, so that's point one. Point two, if they're talking to allies in the press or on Capitol Hill, that's not privileged. If they're talking to the New York Department of Finance, Finance, uh, you know, that's not privileged. Um, so you have to look for these weaknesses. Um, and the good news is uh, email and text messages are for civil litigation, what DNA is for criminal litigation in the sense of once we get the emails, the truth will come out because I've never seen a sweep of emails where people were perfectly, you know, uh, disciplined. Uh, people will always slip up and tell the truth eventually. Uh, even if 99 of the emails are, give me a call, there'll always be one of, you know, we got them, high five, you know, they're on the mat being counted out, whatever. Very, very interesting. Well, David, before I let you go, there's a tradition on the show, the bell is with me. I'm going to ask you quick uh, <laughs> questions. I want a one or two word answer. And the bell is here to keep us honest. The bell is like the constitution, it keeps everybody straight and in line. Hope you ready. I like it. Here we go. What's your, as a lawyer, what's your favorite legal movie of all time? Legal movie of all time. Uh, the Joe Pesci uh, movie, um, you know, from the early 90s. I'm drawing a blank, but. Um... Awesome. What's your favorite Supreme Court judge ever? From all the Supreme Court judges that we've had, what is one that particularly has shaped you? By the way, going back, it was my cousin Vizzy, but I'd say Justice Scalia. Oh, here we go. So the answer to the prior question was my cousin Vizzy, yeah, but Justice cousin Scalia. Cousin Vizzy, yeah. Um, you mentioned you had uh, Tom Cotton and uh, Ted Cruz as an intern. Uh, how, how would you rate them as, as a young lawyer? How would you rate them as you know, young lawyers back were, in the day? They were both amazing. Tom in particular, he had just been a first year student at Harvard Law School and I gave him a brief to write and he came back better than I would have done. And I had been practicing <laughs> for six or seven years. So both of them were big legal talents and would have been super successful. In fact, Ted, one of the arguments he made at the United States Supreme Court, I heard from Justice Scalia, uh, that it was the best argument of the term. So out of the 200 lawyers that argued that year, Justice Scalia thought Ted had done the best and he was a very young lawyer. So they're both big talents. I love it. What's your favorite thing about being a lawyer? Uh, trying to vindicate the rights. I mean, the Constitution of the United States and the Anglo-American tradition, the rule of law, it's such a gift that we've been given by our ancestors. And so to preserve that and make sure that uh, our children and our grandchildren have that benefit, that's why I wake up every day and go to work. Love it. 
uh, a young law graduate comes to you and asks for a piece of advice, what's the one piece of advice you give to anybody who wants to enter the legal profession? Well, make sure that there's something you want to do that you're passionate about. There's typically an inverse relationship between the interest of what you're doing and how much money you make. So, you know, people look and see, oh, this partner at this big firm is making $7 million a year. Okay, but they may be in the ninth circle of hell. So, you know, you just have to be cognizant of that. And to finish it off with David Thompson, the managing partner at Cooper & Kirk. David, this is a traditional question on the Future of Money podcast. If you could have lunch or dinner with one person, dead or alive, lunch or dinner with one person, dead or alive, who would you have lunch or dinner with? Uh, George Washington. I just think he's amazing. Would love to uh, spend time with him. If I could have bet it, that's what the answer. I was going to be one of the founding fathers uh, with uh, your love of the Constitution. David, where can people find you and where can they read about the white paper you guys published? So uh, I'm at cooperkirk.com and uh, we've got our, our uh, white papers on our website under the news tab. So I do encourage people to read it. It's 30 pages, single space. It's all right there. And uh, really, thank you, Henry, for having me on today. It's been great to, to visit with you. Thank you very much, David. And thanks for writing the white paper. I have to say, I totally enjoyed it uh, and I nerded out on it. But I think it's uh, this, this paper deserves a bit more attention in the crypto community and the broader legal community as well. David, thank you for being with us. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And I hope you find this other episode of The Future of Money very insightful. Take care, everybody, and see you all next time.